My son Aaron's going to preach today. Give him a great day. He, uh, uh, really, I was having him preach like every other month or something like that, but he just got so busy. Um, I think the last time he preached was on a Sunday. It was like in February. So um, anyway, I know you. So how many of you have never heard him preach? There's a yeah. There's there's a few of you. Yeah, on a Sunday. So, but before he comes, I want everybody to get a hold of your Bible. Get a hold of your Bible. Amen. Lift up your Bible. Say, this is my Bible. I am what the Bible says I am. I can do what the Bible says I can do. I can have what the Bible says I can have. This day, this day, I am being transformed. I'm moving from faith to faith and from glory to glory. I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I hear. I'm not moved by what I feel. I'm only moved by the Word of God. And the Word of God says, grace and peace is being multiplied to me through the knowledge of God the Father and my Lord Jesus Christ for according to His abundant power has given me all things all things that pertain to life and godliness by the knowledge of Him who has called me to glory called me to virtue that by His precious promises that by His precious promises, I have become a partaker of the divine nature of God. I have escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Give the Lord a great big amen. Amen, hallelujah. See, I'm not preaching today, so I had to get that in there. Amen, hallelujah. Uh, that's 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2-4, through 4, if you're taking notes. Amen. Amen, but it's a good thing to know that you're a partaker of His divine nature. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, I'll tell you what, I better quit. Amen. Y'all ready for Aaron? Y'all ready for Give him a, give him a great big hand. Praise the Lord, everybody. Guys, we can sign. Thank you, Jesus. Everybody, if you would, please stretch your hands this way towards me. We're going to pray over this individual this morning. Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for the anointing of your presence that dwells in this place and that dwells within us. And Father, we ask this morning as this young man speaks, God, that you would speak through him by the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, that the things that he says wouldn't be his words or his opinions, but they'd be your word. That they'd be your opinions in Jesus' name. We confess today, Father, that we have the mind of Christ and that it's your mind that is flowing into us this morning. We thank you for the anointing of your presence and for the grace of God upon this day today and upon this word, God. Anoint us to receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. But if you would, please, this morning, I'd like you to grab your Bible, the one you're just holding up. We had three of them over there holding up one Bible. It was pretty awesome. Turn to the book of Isaiah. Chapter 9. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, one of the things that um, I get told all the time is, you know, and I'm sure that the other members of the team hear this from time to time, is, you know, you get off the, the, the stage and you're done worshiping God and you're worn out <coughs> and you had a wonderful time with the Lord and a wonderful time in His presence. Sound familiar to anybody? And people come up to you and they say, man, that was amazing. That was, that was awesome. And uh, one of the things that, um, that we try to do is, is, you know, one of the things that we try to encourage is, you know, it's a family thing. You know, it's not a one-man show. It's not a one-woman show. It's a family thing. It takes a team. Yeah. You know, Jesus said that it's the body, you know. It's the body. Pastor always says, if my elbow itches, my hand scratches it. I like to borrow that from him. And you know, when we come here and we listen to the work of the Spirit of God, you're important. 
Just like you look up here, you see this praise or worship team. And it's not one individual playing a keyboard or playing a guitar or playing the drums or, or singing. It's a group. It's a family of individuals. You're important to the family of the body of Christ. You're important to this church. Amen. Even those of you that may only come on Sunday mornings or once every other Sunday. Or, I better not go there. I might get in trouble. <laughs> You're important to this body. You're important what you do, the fact that you show up. Not just you showing up because you're another person to fill a seat. That's not it at all. You can go to a football stadium. You can pay people to fill seats. People have done it before in the past. The reason you're important is because when you gather together with a body of believers, there's a combined anointing that's released. The Bible says, Jesus said, that out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. Well, if you've got a river and I've got a river and we all get together, what is that? That's something really big, really awesome, Amen. really amazing. And when the Spirit of God begins to flow and you step into the spontaneous, the anointing of His presence is unleashed in a deeper level, in a deeper dimension. You know, people always say, well, I can experience the presence of God at home. Well, that's true, and you should be experiencing the presence of God at home. But when Jesus left, He told them, not Him, not her, He told them, go and tarry. And when the Holy Spirit came, He didn't come on one individual. He came on them collectively. Amen. He came on them as a group. Acts chapter 2 didn't happen in somebody's living room, folks. Come on. Hello. It didn't happen with the guy and the guy's wife and the guy's three little kids. It happened with the family all together. God is in the family. And the one thing that the enemy stands against is family. The enemy hates family. That's why he hates churches. That's why Satan hates pastors. That's why people, people get so angry at pastors because the devil, if he can hurt you through a leader, he will. Why? Because then he can stop you and me from receiving what God has for us. That's right. You know, Greg Strauss always tells me this. He always says, you know, Aaron, he says, the spirit of God always flows from the top down. He always reminds me of that. And he always says to me, Aaron, you've got to make sure that you've got your mind right. Because if you come up and you lead a team and your mind's not right, it flows from the top down. Amen. Right? What does that mean? That means you've got to pray for your leaders. That means you've got to submit and honor your leaders. You know, for me as a young man, I grew up with my dad. And growing up, listening to and obeying my dad taught me how to submit to the will and the authority of Jesus Christ. You know what I found out? I found out that my dad was human. I found out that he wasn't perfect. You know what else I found out? God didn't care. Amen. When it comes to me, God doesn't care that he's human. God doesn't care that he's imperfect. God only cares whether or not I am, I as his son, am obeying. Now, thank God I'm not only his son in the natural, but I'm his son in the faith. And some people think that's a mess, but it's actually a big blessing. Why? Because I don't have to decipher when he's my spiritual leader and when he's my father. I just say, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and so growing up it made it very easy for me as a pastor's son not to miss the time that God wanted to pour out on my life because I got in the habit of just saying yes sir now it took me a while to get there dad's got plenty of stories especially when I was 15, 16 but once he got me there, I was able to step into the fullness of what God had for me. And Pastor always likes telling the story of how God touched my life and, and I went into a season of prayer and fasting and sought the Lord. But you know, it wasn't during that season of prayer and fasting that I learned obedience. I learned obedience. You know, the Bible says that Christ learned obedience through the things that he suffered. He learned obedience. He didn't come obedient. Think about that. Jesus had to learn to obey. That'll mess us up. He came to earth, not just to die, but he came to earth to show us as the human race how to obey our Heavenly Father. Why do we obey our Heavenly Father? Because for thousands of years, he's been trying to bless us. He's been trying to strengthen us. He's been trying to love us. And the result of disobedience is failure to receive his love. Amen. Right? Those of you that have children, you want your children to have a nice vehicle someday, but if they're three years old, you're not going to go out and buy them a Ferrari. Why? They've got to first learn to obey. They've got to learn to obey the turn signals. They've got to learn when to stop. They've got to learn when to go. They've got to learn when to turn and when not to turn. They've got to learn what a speed limit is and what that actually means. Of course, a lot of us are still trying to learn that one, and I'm, I'm in that group, unfortunately. 
<laughs> but when your son or your daughter reaches the age of maturity, you can then trust him. Paul the Apostle said, when I was young, I acted like a child. I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. And the issue, the reason Christ came to earth, the reason Christ came to earth was because obedience could not be established in the angelic race. One third of them failed. Obedience could not be established in the Adamic race, which is us, the human race. Adam rebelled. Right? So Jesus came again to establish obedience. And the problem with us as humans is we, when we hear the word obey, we see God with this giant stick ready to bash us in the head and we say, well, why? Right? But the purpose of obedience is not so that somebody on top of us feels big and important. The purpose of obedience is is so that the person we're obeying is able to bless us. Amen. God's will is that you should prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Is that what the Bible says? Yes. Amen. Is that what it says? Yes. And the reason the enemy seeks to deceive, to manipulate, to steal, to kill, and to destroy is to stop you from receiving blessing through leadership. Amen. Mm-hmm. That's his goal. Are you in Isaiah chapter 9 yet? Did I tell you chapter 9? Yeah. Yeah. But Isaiah chapter 9, we're going to start in verse 6. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son, someone who has to learn obedience, is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Why did Jesus come? Jesus didn't come just to wreck an old covenant and establish a new one. Jesus didn't come to start something else. Jesus didn't come. He came to fulfill the previous covenant. Grab your Bible with me. Turn to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 34. Jesus came to fulfill the purpose of God. Jesus came to fulfill Everything that God gave to Abraham and said, if you do this, you're blessed. If you live this, you're blessed. If you can say this and abide by it, you're blessed. Jesus came as the fulfillment of those doctrines. The New Testament is not a separate testament. It's the same testament. It's the same covenant. What does that mean? That means you have the blessing of Abraham. That means the things that you touch should prosper. That means your family should increase. Why? Because you have the blessing of Abraham. The blessing came from God. And you're connected through the blood of Christ Jesus. Ezekiel chapter 34 verse 10. It says, and he said, behold, I make a what? I make a covenant. No, not all things new. Not this time. That's in Revelation. Before thy people, I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. What's the purpose for his covenant? To do marvels through you. Read the next part of the verse. For it is a terrible thing that I will do with you. Now that word terrible is a bad translation. In Aaron's gangster translation, it would be awesome. Touch your neighbor and say awesome. It is an awesome thing. It is a thing that is so great, that is so big, that it will strike terror in the hearts of the enemies of God, in the enemies of the Lord. Jesus came to fulfill the covenant that God gave you and me. And the purpose for that covenant is so that God can do marvels through you, so that God can show forth his glory and his power and his amazingness through you. See, we get this, this ungodly idea from somewhere of God. You keep your people humble and we'll keep them poor. First of all, that's not anywhere in the Bible. Right? You keep them humble, we'll keep them poor. We'll let them know they're not worth anything. We'll let them know that they're a worm. How about you've been redeemed? You're not a sinner anymore. You're a saint. You've been redeemed from the curse of the law. And the purpose of God's covenant with you is so that the world can see how great he is. Back in the Roman times, they would have slaves. And most of these slaves were actually British white people. And they took these slaves and they would make them do whatever they wanted them to do. But whenever they had a slave go into the city, they dressed them up. Why? Because the slave has to show what his master is like. So they would take the slave, they'd put shoes on their feet. Slaves didn't wear shoes back then. They'd put shoes on their feet. They'd put some jewelry on their hands. They'd take off that dirty robe they were wearing, the dirty tunic, and they'd give them a nice one. 
And they'd say, okay, now you go do my business for me. Even if they were a bad slave owner. Why would they do that? Because it all went back to the owner. You know the Bible says that you've been bought with a price? That means I and you, we don't belong to us. We don't belong to ourselves. We belong to Him. And you know what His purpose is? To show forth His marvels through you. God is saying, I'm going to do a new thing that will shock the world. How's He going to do it? Through you. Through you. How does God bring revival? Touch yourself. Through you. Say, through me. How does God move? Through me. How does the name of Jesus get lifted up? Right. Through you. So if Jesus' name is going to get lifted up, who has to get lifted up? You do. And that means we must come to the place where we can be trusted by God. That's why Jesus had to learn obedience. So that when the world looked at him, they could not just see a Savior, but they could see God. They could see a man who was pure, a man who was holy, a man who was obedient, a man who was righteous, a man who said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. As he says in Hebrews chapter 10. See, the amazingness of this is that Jesus came and obeyed God. But not only did he obey God, who Adam could not obey, but he obeyed man. Whom he created. God comes to earth and obeys his creation. Simply to prove to man the power of obedience. Amen. Isn't that amazing? Amen. He doesn't just come to obey. Adam could not obey God, the creator of the universe. The one who flung the stars in the galaxy. Adam and Eve rebel. And God, the one who created it all, comes to earth and obeys man. That's amazing. When did he obey man? Twelve years old, preaching in the temple. What does the Bible said he do? He went back and did what? Submitted to them. Right? Jesus said, my kingdom is of what? Not of this world. Right? I'm not going to overthrow the government. I'm not going to overthrow the Pharisees. I'm here to establish obedience. Why? Because my kingdom is of another type. My kingdom is of another kind. Turn your Bibles with me to the book of Habakkuk, chapter 3 and verse 2. Say, God's going to do it through me. You have to realize that you are great in the eyes of God. You are great in the eyes of God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Hmm. When you got it, say amen. amen. I want you to see this with me. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 2. O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known. And in wrath, remember mercy. God has to revive something dead on the inside of us. What is it that dies? Our revelation of who we are. You say, well, what do you mean? Don't you mean who he is? No, I mean who you are. Who are you? Who are you? You say, well, I'm Aaron. I got red hair, I got blue eyes. No, 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 no. Who are you? Well, I'm a youth pet. No, that's what you do. I work at such and such a place. That's what you do. Who are you? You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You are a candle. You are a child of the Most High God. You are adopted and loved. Right? These are all from scriptures in the New Testament. You are chosen. A royal priesthood. A peculiar people. See, the problem is that before we begin to, begin to forget who God is, we begin to forget who we are. Come on. And so what happens is because we forget who we are, we seek to manipulate and control those around us without even realizing it. We fail to talk to those around us with honor and with respect, and instead we make cracks and jokes about how something that they did that was stupid or ignorant, not because we think they're stupid or ignorant, but because we've forgotten who we are. We don't know who we are. And so because we don't know who we are, our personalities become messed up in this, in this, this attempt to remember who we are and try to figure out what we're supposed to be doing. 
And so we subconsciously take opportunities to speak to others to help them forget who they are because we don't know who we are anyway. We've forgotten. The Jewish people were in this predicament. They forgot who God was. They forgot His calling on their life. They forgot the purpose for which they, they were established. Listen to this. This is Isaiah chapter 9 verse 8. Just listen. It says, The Lord sent His word against Jacob, and it has fallen on Israel. All the people will know of Ephraim and the inhabitant of Samaria, who say with pride and arrogance of their heart, The bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will replace with cedars. In other words, this. I don't see the leadership doing what I think it should do. I don't see God through them doing what I think they should do. So you know what? We're going to rebuild. We're going to reestablish. We're going to make it work. And we're going to get this thing done. We got an awful lot of us in there. We got an awful lot of I in there. What happened to Father? You show me the purpose that you have for my life. You show me as I submit, as I listen, as I obey. Yes, sir. I'm here for orders, sir. I'm here to listen to the plan and purpose that you have for my life, sir. I'm here to dwell in the secret place, sir. Tell me what your goal for my life is, sir. Amen. See, the problem wasn't just that Israel had forgotten God. The problem was they forgot what God thought about them. Amen. Then they forgot God. Then they forgot His precepts. Why? Because it's way harder to obey a precept when you don't know why you're obeying it. Why am I sacrificing you this? Oh, because God says so. Why? No, no, no. I'm giving this sacrifice because I've been chosen. Because I've been marked. And because he's marked me, he's blessed me. And I'm going to show him I'm thankful. Amen. I want to show him I'm thankful. I want to honor him. I want to glorify him. See, this is why the whole world is slipping away from the grasp of the presence of God. Amen. Why? Because they come and they worship on Sunday to fulfill a moral duty. Yeah, they're committed. Yeah, they're focused. But why? Why? Because they think that they have to do it. Come on. Break it. Now, why do we go to church? Why? Because we're the chosen of God. We're the people of God. We're the blessed of God. We're the anointed of God. And He's done so much for us. So he hasn't done much for me. Well, go to blessing Him. Amen. Go to thanking Him. Go to rejoicing in Him. Go to remembering who you are. Go to remembering that you're blessed of God. You've been chosen. You've been bought with a price. Go to remembering who you are. Jesus never forgot who He was. Everybody in Jerusalem at the time of his appearing had forgotten who they were. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Zealots. What the Zealots do? They said, well, we don't see this Messiah guy coming anytime soon. So you know what? We're going to take matters into our own hands. And what we're going to do is we're going to start to kill off these Roman soldiers. We're going to get them out of here. We're going to start to take control and forcefully advance what we think needs to be accomplished by our own will, by our own hand. They forgot who they were. Amen. The Sadducees, well, that guy, God, we ain't seen him in a whole long time. We ain't seen him raise no dead folk. We ain't seen no angels appear. We ain't seen none of that. So you know what? We think that must have died with the prophets. Sounds like some people today, doesn't it? Huh? We ain't seen no miracles. We ain't seen Elijah. We ain't seen no signs. We ain't seen no wonders. So you know what? We just don't think God is doing that anymore. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in the miraculous power of God. They didn't believe in any of that. Why? They forgot who they were. Then you've got the Pharisees. Now they had it under control. The Pharisees actually resemble us. <laughs> the Pharisees believed in the power of God. The Pharisees believed he could raise the dead. The Pharisees themselves cast out devils. Amen. How do you know that? Because Jesus said, if I cast out devils by Bezalel, then whom do your sons cast them out? Jesus asserted that they cast out devils too. The Pharisees would cast out devils. What was the problem? What was the problem? They said, well, this Jesus guy ain't doing it the way we think it ought to be done. Right? Right? After all, he was born in a manger. He was born in a feeding trough. Right? In a cave with a bunch of stank animals. 
And that guy preached this Friday, he was wrapped in swaddling clothes. He explained to us why it is that that's actually what they wrap dead people in. It's like, you know what, we can't find them. Oh, you know what, here's some spare dead people cloth that look like it's been used. We'll wrap them in that! A child, a child, freezing in the cold. Right? Let's bring in silver and gold. No, that doesn't look like a king to me. Especially if I'm a Pharisee. And you're from Galilee? Who do you think you are? Who, what do you think you're doing? The Son of God? If you were to stand up in the majority of churches in America today and say, I am the anointed of the Most High God. I am chosen of God. You'd have a bunch of people second-guessing you. And you know what? That's exactly what they did to Jesus. The established church of the day. They second-guessed him. They said, who do you think you are? They said, why are you here? Man, we were in the room when you were born. We, we can go to the place where you were born. We were there and we were in the synagogue when Zechariah and all those dudes were around there. We were there. We know your cousin, John the Baptist, bro. We know all these people. You ain't nothing special. You ain't nothing amazing. But Jesus came to fulfill a covenant. He came to fulfill a purpose. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, you know what God is saying to you? I'm going to lift you up. I want to exalt you. That will mess your religious mind up. God wants to, yeah, I want to exalt you. What did he say to Abraham? I will make you the father of many nations, and through you will all the nations of the earth be blessed. They're going to know who you are, Jack. Amen. They're going to know what God has done in your life. Man, Abraham did some stupid behind stuff. Gave his wife away. Come on. Man, Jacob did some stupid behind stuff. They all made mistakes. They all had issues. But God used them to establish his covenant. Right? One of the sisters of the 12 guys of the 12 tribes, Dinah. Man, she got raped. Man, Judah. Judah had sex with a harlot. They were some messed up folk. And when God looked at them, when they began to obey the covenant and they repented, he said, these are my chosen. They're God's chosen. So stop looking at the problems you have in your marriage. Stop looking at the problems you have with your children. Stop, stop letting other people glorify the issues in your family. Amen. Burn. That's good. I need to say that again. You need to stop letting other people glorify and magnify the problems that they know are in your family. Amen. That ain't their job. Amen. People come up to me all the time and say, well, your brother this and your sister's that. I'm like, hold up a second. First of all, are you in a leadership authority? Second of all, are you coming to me about this because you care or because you want to run your mouth? Yes, yes, yes. Amen. Hello? Why not? Did you pray about that? Did you get a word from God? Yes. Hello? Did you get a word from God? You know, it's a whole... The time of church leadership with a bunch of dudes sitting at a table saying, well, what do you think about that? What do you think about that? That's over. That's gone. The church leadership of people that say, okay, Holy Spirit, speak to us. That's what this church is going to be founded on. That's what it is founded on. We're an apostolic church. What does that mean? That means we sit down and we say, what does the word of God say? What does the Bible say? All right, now let's pray about it and see what the Holy Ghost says. What did he say? Well, we got three different things. Well, we better pray again. Hello. Let's go to God and hear his voice again. This whole, well, I think this, and you think this, and you think that. I don't see no opinion in here. Right? That's not how we do it in these last days, folks. That's not how we do it in our families. We don't sit down, mom and dad, well, what do you think? Well, I don't know, well, what do you think? Well, what does the word say? What does the word say about how to raise Johnny and Sally? What does the word say? What did God show me about their life? You can hear from God. You can hear that. Why? It's part of your covenant. That's right. It's the covenant that you have with God. What did Jesus say? My sheep know. Not ought to. Not should. Not someday in the sweet by and by. I might hear my voice sometime. Maybe sort of kind of if. My sheep know. My voice. Amen. If you're saved, I want you to raise your hand. If you know Jesus is your Lord Savior, raise your hand. All right. You have the ability to hear the voice of God. You have the ability. You know, Abraham wasn't a pastor. He wasn't, he wasn't a preacher. He's a businessman. 
<laughs> Think about it. Abraham was a businessman. Business. He's a businessman. Abraham was a businessman. What did he do? Bought stuff. Read it. Bought stuff. Traded stuff. Sold stuff. Bought more stuff. Got given stuff. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> right? He's a businessman. God used a businessman to establish his covenant. That's right. Why, why do you think the Jews are known for being good with finances? Amen. Why? Abraham was a businessman, bro. He knows how to use his money. Why? He's got the blessing of God upon him. What did he do? When Kizildek showed up, he said, you need a tenth of everything I got. Right? <laughs> Come on. God has a covenant established with you. And his purpose is to use you to do signs, to do wonders, to do miracles. Amen. And see, the issue is that Satan, you know the Bible says that Satan stood up against the church. It says that Satan stood up against Job. It says that Satan rose against this person, rose against that king. Y'all read those spots in the Bible? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Some of you are like, what? <laughs> yeah. What does the enemy try to do? He tries to get somebody that you trust to hurt you. Amen. Right. Right. And nine times out of ten, he's successful. Right? Somebody asked, uh, what was his name? Kenneth Hagin. Somebody asked Kenneth Hagin. He said, have you ever gotten offended? He said, no. He said, I had a lot of opportunities. I just never took any. Amen. That's the way I would be. Amen. The devil tries to do something to offend you. Some leader, some loved one, some family member, somebody somewhere did something. And then he wants us to view our whole life through that. Yeah. That's right? right? Yep. Mm-hmm. He wants us to view ourselves. He wants you to view you through what happened to you. Right. Instead of viewing you through what he did. Yeah. Okay. Through what he's done. You're not a byproduct of your circumstance. Amen. Abraham wasn't. Man, Abraham, Dave, Abraham said, I'll tell you what, let me take your servant. Say, what? Let me take your servant and we'll, we'll, we'll have a kid with the servant. What? And in the New Testament, the Bible says, God called him the father of many nations. You know what we would have said? Man, I know your story. You can't be no father of no many nations. I know the details, bro. I know what happened. I know how you messed up. But the Bible says that his faith was counted to him for righteousness. Stop looking at your backstory. Stop looking at what happened. Stop looking at what that person did to you. Why? Because God is sick and tired of me and sick and tired of you walking around the same night. God's got a promised land for you. And God wants you to get in the promised That's why Jesus came. Jesus came to take the children of Israel into the promised land. Why aren't they in the promised land? I'll tell you why. Because they missed the time of their visitation. Because they knew where Jesus was from. They missed the time of the outpouring of God because they knew where Jesus was from. They saw him get raised up. They saw what he did and we said, we ain't listening to you, buddy. Amen. And everything that we're in right now is that. Yeah. Waiting for them to say, okay, I'm done rebuilding. I'm going to wait on the Messiah. Yeah. And you know what happens? He splits the clouds. Yeah. And he returns to save his bride. Amen. <laughs> He returns to save Israel. That's what the second coming is all about. If they'd accept, listen to this, if they would have accepted Jesus, if they'd have said, you know what, you might have came in a manger, you might have had swaddling clothes, you might not have no white horse, and you might not have a crown, but you know what, you're the Messiah, we're going to follow you, we'd be in the millennium right now. Jesus would be ruling from Israel. And the whole world would be blessed. The wars would be over. All the problems and difficulties would be done with. Wouldn't nobody be killing everybody else? Wouldn't nobody be starving? Wouldn't there be no sex trafficking? There wouldn't be any of that. Why? Because Jesus is ruling. Now let's flip this for just a second. If he's ruling in our life, then that means you can step into your promised land. Amen. Amen. What we want to do is we just we want to take those spots, those blemishes, in our hearts. And then we'll say, okay, God, I know this is going to hurt. I know it's going to be totally against what I think. 
and my opinion and everything that I, but if it's in here, you take this out and make this match this. Yeah. Amen. Make it match this. Real quick, Genesis 28. See, the purpose of God working in our hearts and in our lives is not just to change us, it's to bless us. Why? You're his kids. God would rather you, God, God wants to put his kids in a Ferrari. Yeah. Yes, he does. Now that doesn't mean I'm going to waste a bunch of money and go buy a Ferrari. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Why? Because we got a job to get done first. Amen. Right? Amen. There's plenty of souls out there that are heading for hell. And you know what? We're taking as many of, we, many of them as we can Amen. with us. Y'all in uh, Genesis 28? <laughs> Look at this. This is what he says. Jump to verse 13. And behold... The Lord stood above it, this is Jacob's ladder, and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac. Let's just stop right there for a minute. You notice God comes to him and God tells him, I'm the God of the leadership that has gone before you. Got quiet. I'm the God. God didn't say, hey, I'm Yahweh. It's time for you to start serving me. He said, I'm the God that the people that have gone before you have served. I'm the God that they knew. I'm the God that the people that have gone before you, who have led for you, who have prayed over your life. It's important to have a leader. It's important to have a father. It's important to follow that man, to follow that woman, to obey that man, to obey that woman. Right? Why? Because of this next verse. Also your descendants, verse 14, shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread to the east and the west, to the north and the south. In you and your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God wants you to be blessed. God wants the people that know you to be blessed because of you. God wants those that know the people that know you to be blessed because of you. Because you're an influence in their life. Because you're the man, because you're the woman of God, and you're there. Now listen to this. This is the highest point in Jacob's life. <clears throat> you know why? Because he got a word from God. The highest point in your life is not the point of the most fun. The highest point in your life is not the point where you're most successful. The highest point in your life is when you hear God's voice. When you hear from Him. Why? Because it's in that that He directs you. That means if you're at a point in your life where you're not sure what to do, or you don't have blessing, or you're not sure where to sow your seed, what does that mean? Hear from God. God, Amen. get a word, hear a word, listen to this, Psalms 91.1, he that dwells where, how many know, in a secret place, shall abide where, in the shadow of who, the Almighty, you need a word, you need blessing, you need to be fulfilled with what Jesus wants you to have and wants to be fulfilled, I would that they would prosper and be in health even as their soul their soul, their mind, their will, and their emotions. I'm going to tell you why the people of God struggle from week to week. I want to tell you why their families are in pain and in turmoil. I want to tell you why we have trouble trusting one another. You know why? It's because we're not prospering in our soul. We're not prospering in our mind. We're not prospering in our heart. There's transformation that has to take place in us, in me, in you. Why? Can I tell you something? God doesn't have another church in this area to bring revival. And there's a lot of people that might be upset with me if they heard that. But you know what? I don't really care. Not because I'm stuck up. But because I know the call of God that God has on you and on me as a body. I know why God placed us here. Amen. When I was 14 years old, I used to walk in these woods and pray over them that God would put a church here that was full of the Spirit of God. Amen. I remember it. I used to stretch my hands out. I'd walk back in the woods. And I'd stretch my hands out toward 204. And I'd say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you someday, somehow, there's going to be our church over there. In Jesus' name, it's going to be a big property. And the fire of God is going to fall upon yeah. Hallelujah. I was 12, 13, 14 years old. Never told my parents that. Never did. I'd go back in the woods, and that's where I would pray. I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know God was going to send all of you here. I didn't know that. I didn't know any of that at all. I could barely play the keyboard. I barely stood this tall. I was a little 11. 
But you know what? I know that God has you strategically positioned for a purpose for his kingdom. Just like God strategically positioned Jesus and he put a star and he told the wise men they weren't Christians. They weren't even Jews. They were, they were secular people. They followed the star. God's got direction of his spirit for you to follow. And God is going to guide your life and direct your life. Why? Because God wants to establish an end time move of his spirit. And God needs you to do it. I'll get it later. God needs you to do it. He doesn't have anybody else. He doesn't have somebody else to do it. He needs you. He needs you to walk in blessing. He needs you to walk in strength. Thank you, Greg. He needs you to walk in the power of his spirit. I want to tell you this. God doesn't have another family besides your family to work through. He doesn't have another individual to move by the power of His Spirit. He's waiting on you. He's waiting on you. Why don't He find somebody else? He tried. Well, where's that in the Bible? My eyes run to and fro throughout the whole earth to find somebody this is my paraphrase version. It's not sold in stores. <laughs> Whose heart is loyal towards me. That means he's been looking. See, God is not limited like we are. He don't just find the first person and say, oh, well, you'll do. And stop looking. God looks. And you know what? He found you. You didn't find God. You didn't know where to look. <laughs> God found you. And he found you for a strategic, specific purpose. Amen. Every stronghold that the enemy seeks to manipulate. Notice I didn't say sets up. Strongholds don't belong to him. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip this for just a second so you can see where I'm coming from. Strongholds don't belong to the enemy. They're opportunities to see the power of God move in your family and in my family. They're opportunities. Every difficulty, it's an opportunity. Come on, somebody. It's an opportunity. Jesus was born in a manger. What an opportunity. Uh-huh. He was wrapped in swaddling clothes. What an opportunity. King Herod sought to kill him. What an opportunity. He was born by a 14-year-old girl, and I bet you she didn't know what was up. What in the world? Joseph certainly didn't. <coughs> I told the youth Friday night, I said, think about it this way. There's a groom about to marry a bride. The bride gets pregnant, and it ain't his kid. I think the groom would be pretty upset. Don't you? What an opportunity. What an opportunity. God's got opportunities for you. Amen. And God's not going to let you and me abort the baby he put in us just because we messed it up. Amen. It doesn't matter what happened in your past. It doesn't matter what the devil did. It doesn't matter what leader, what pastor, what elder, what person, what family member, what dad, what mom, what brother, what sister hurt you, what boss. doesn't matter. Now, it does matter. It does matter because it's an opportunity for you. Why? When you forgive, you get set that much higher. Why? Because you choose to lift Jesus up. Amen. When you walk in grace, you get set that much higher because you choose to lift. And Jesus said, if I be lifted up, if I be lifted up, Amen. <laughs> when Jesus gets lifted up, guess who gets lifted up with him? Amen. You. Why? You're his bride. Amen. You're his bride. Let's go to one more verse. Turn to Psalms 23.3 with me. Psalms 23.3. I know you know this one, but I want you to look at it with me. I want you to see it. Because it's powerful. You'll see that up there. He restores my soul. You know, you can be strengthened and not be restored. That's right. You can keep pushing, you can keep pressing, you can feel energized. You can be anointed but not be restored. You realize that? Why? Because somewhere inside, 
somewhere inside, if somebody pushes the right buttons, or says the right thing, those emotions, those feelings, they still come back. What does that mean? That means we need Him to restore our soul. Amen. Yes. Yes. <laughs> this isn't a you problem. This is an us problem. Amen. You with me? Yep. This is an us problem. So what do we need? We need Him to restore our soul. We need Him to say, God, Lord, restore that, that spot. That spot. And if you're like me, you can be a person who thinks it's okay now. And then something happens, it's like, oh, there it is again. There it is again. Right? Just go talk to a Jewish person. Bring up the Messiah. I've done it before. Bring up the Messiah. You know what 99% you know of them say, the ones I've met? They say, what does it matter? You know what I said? I said, well, I think it does matter. I said, because if you're right and I'm wrong, then I'm really messed up and I'm going to hell. But if I'm right and you're wrong, then you're really messed up. You missed the Messiah and you're going to hell. That's a big deal. Amen. That's a really big deal. It does matter. Now go back with me. We're going to go to this, this last verse. I want you to listen to this. Isaiah 9. Just listen to this. This is the end of it. This is Jesus' return. Praise and worship team, can you please come up? Of the increase of his government. Listen. Of the increase of his government. There shall be no end. When Jesus returns, he's going to establish government. He's going to lead. Right? He's going to establish leadership. He's going to establish government. Why? He's coming back. But in the meantime, in the meantime, he's directed that government to you and to me. To watch. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 1. I will watch and see what he will say unto me. What I shall answer when I am approved. Write the vision, it says before that. Make it plain that he that reads it may run with it. So this is for somebody. You need to write down what God wants to do in your family. Amen. I know families, they've had the same anointing from the great-grandma to the grandma to the mother to the daughter to the daughter's daughter. And haven't fulfilled it because the enemy keeps sowing seeds and trying to mess stuff up Amen. and discourage them. And sometimes they get to thinking they can't fulfill it. Mm -hmm. Just some personal friends of mine that I've known for years and years and years. You know what? I begin to pray for that family and I say, no devil, not on my watch. Right. Not on my watch. Yeah. And you know what? These pastors, they pray for you and they pray for your family. You know what they say? Not on our watch. Yeah. You're not going to mess these families up on our watch. Yeah. You know, the enemy wants family to be a fragile, delicate thing. When I say family, I mean your family, I mean her family, I mean his family, I mean my family, I mean this church family. Because we're connected. Right? When your family hurts, my family hurts. When your family's going through struggles, you don't even got to tell nobody. Right? You don't even got to tell nobody. God let somebody know. Why? God will tell somebody, pray. Pray. And you know something? <laughs> He'll tell somebody that he knows won't run their mouth about you. That's right. Amen. You know why? He's got to be able to trust them. That's right. He's got to be able to trust them. You want to hear from God? Stop talking about people. Yeah. You want to hear from God? Stop saying, well, you know, buddy so-and-so needs to do such and such. Stop that. God can't trust you. Amen. He can't work through that. No. Talk to him. You know something? He already knows the problem. You ain't got to tell him what the problem is. He's God. Amen. Amen. Pray the breakthrough. Pray the deliverance. Pray the restitution. Pray the restoration. I don't know what it is you need in your family today or in your personal life or in your job, but I know somewhere, somehow, for most of us, you might be exempt from this, but if you're like me, you're the most of us. You need Him to restore something. Something in your soul. You know what? That's why Jesus came. To restore that that was lost. To buy back that which had been stolen, which had run away from him. So since that's us this morning, we want to ask God, Lord, the same power that you released when Christ was brought into the earth. You know there was power when Christ brought, was brought into the earth. There were angels singing. Shepherds saw stuff. 
Wise men saw stuff. Right? Things happen. And God's going to make things happen in your life and in your family. Amen. Won't you stand to your feet with me this morning? Amen. Because Jesus died and rose again, because you've accepted Him as your Lord and Savior, this Christmas, you're not going to have that family trouble that sometimes comes up. Will you listen to me? That's for somebody. You're not going to have those difficulties that sometimes come up. You know why? Because this Christmas, you're going to walk in the power of His redeeming, restoring love. If you've got something deep, prayer team, if you could come up here, pastor, elders. If you've got something deep, something that you need to tell somebody specifically, these leaders, these people are here to pray with you and for you. They've helped me. Thank God for them. Why? Because this Christmas season, God has restoration for you, for your family. I encourage you to stand in for somebody. If there's somebody that you're believing for, I want to welcome you this morning to come up to one of these leaders, one of these elders, and say, hey, I'm praying for so-and-so. I'm praying for their restoration. I'm praying for their salvation. Pray with me. Just give them their first name. You, ain't, you don't have to explain details. Nobody needs to know but you and God. <coughs> Lift your hands with me this morning. Father, in Jesus' name, we just come before you right now. And God, we receive restoration in our families, in our relatives, in our own life, God. I, Aaron Van Gorb, I receive restoration. Your redeeming power, your redeeming love. The same power. Because God, we know that you have need of us. You have need of our families. You have need of our lives. We lay hold of that redeeming grace this morning. Thank you, God. As Greg and Tammy lead us in worship right now, I want to welcome you right now to come and either receive prayer for yourself, for your family, or for somebody that you know. Stand in the gap for them this morning. Stand in the gap for them this morning. Say, God, I know somebody, I know so-and-so, and I'm believing for the restoration. I'm believing for the redemption. God's in the restoring business this morning. He's in the restoring business this morning. Thank you, Lord.